I'm going to show you a picture and share a story with you about grit, which will also be a part of the sermon theme this morning, but about America and about our heritage, price that people have paid for you to be able to sit here in great freedom this morning. While you are sitting here this morning, I am told that there are some three million people that are being surrounded by an army on the other side of the world, and they're expecting just a mass slaughter of people in the next few weeks. You are so privileged to be able to get in your vehicle and drive off to church and come in the church doors and to celebrate the Lord with liberty. You'll remember there are some 300,000 people expected to die this year as martyrs for the Christian faith. So I'm going to unabashedly tell you that I am thrilled to live in America. I rejoice for this country, and I pray that this song may be true, that God would bless it, and that God would restore to us memory that the founders of this country, whatever quirks they had with their theology, believed that the Bible was the book we ought to go by. When the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and all of those wonderful documents were written, those people who met together, they thought that this was the sacred book that should guide this country. And you will please always remember that the first public schools in America, this was sometimes the only textbook, often the only textbook. And that the first great universities in this country, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, the College of William and Mary, where I attended, was founded primarily to train ministers and many other colleges and universities. But that's not what some of the media and the liberals would have us believe. So I pray that God may restore to us an appreciation of our heritage. Now the picture. This picture is 1943. 1942, we were sensitive and became aware that the Japanese were talking about coming across into Alaska and coming down through from the north and invading. The President of the United States issued an order that a road was to be built in and through Alaska to protect us going north. He pulled out all stops and released the budget, whatever it took, and committed 10,000 American soldiers and others too to get the road put through to Alaska in the shortest time possible. They literally built several miles of road per day, every day, several miles built, in uncharted wilderness that had never been surveyed, Nobody even knew what was over the next mountain, hadn't had even airplanes fly over some of it, and surveyors literally would only get the road charted for the next day by nightfall, and the crews would go the path they charted through swamps, cross rivers, or whatever else. At the beginning of World War II and until that time, black people could serve in the United States military, but they were always held to lower positions. But the desperation to get this road in was so fierce by the president that they commissioned more than 3,000 black soldiers to help with the road, but they decided they would not let them work alongside the white soldiers and the other soldiers of other countries who are part of our military. So they had black soldiers take a section of the road to be built and the white soldiers a section and they were to meet and the black soldiers absolutely matched the work of the white soldiers. And this is a picture when the bulldozers met and the road was joined together. This is a picture on your right of the black soldier at the bulldozer who pulled up and the white soldier, the bulldozer pulled up and the bulldozers met and they got off and they shook hands. This picture changed the world. That picture went worldwide and shook the world. And it was the first time that 
the world recognized and the United States recognized that black people were as smart as white people and should be promoted with the equivalency and the equality of white people. And it opened up the military ranks and changed the American military. And it was the predicate, this picture became a predicate according to some historians for the whole civil rights movement that later emanated. So that is a powerful picture. If you've never seen it before, hope you will remember it. Hope you will remember that there are people, not just this story, but many others are people who have served our country to bring us the freedoms that we enjoy. And now, bottom line, I wanted you to see the grit. I wanted you to understand what drove those black soldiers. They said, we're going to show them that we're as good as they are. And now I'm going to preach about grit just after I pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this morning. Thank you that you are trying to build champions in these times, champions with grit. We pray for the Holy Spirit to deal kindly with us this morning and that you would teach us by your word. That's what we ask. We ask that you would take the word and instruct us in Jesus' name and receive our tithe and our offering today, and may it be glorious to you and make provision, not just for Covenant Church here, but for the missions works that we do in the community and around the world. In Jesus' name, and the people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. So I want to talk to you about champions in difficult times. Yes, I think these are difficult times. One of the new things that's come out in the news this week is that uh, people are now deciding that they will not have a minister, a justice of the peace, or anybody else do their wedding, that a man and a woman will just go off somewhere, stand on a rock, and say their vows, and be married. Uh, they don't, they, and, and the sociologists clearly say that this is another move that says we want God out of our lives, we don't want family in our lives, we don't want friends in our lives, we want to do what we want to do, and we, just want, we don't want to be responsible to anybody. So it's another Thing to kick religion out, to get God out of the picture. I think these are difficult times for us when good is often applauded as bad and bad is applauded as good, and we have to ask ourselves, what is the truth? And where are the real champions that stand up? Where are the real champions? You know, in some churches in America this morning, in some churches in America, we would have not been able to say, little girl Olive, little girl Jada, and little boy Sebastian. We wouldn't have been able to say that in some churches in America. Because we're not supposed to say boy girl. I think we're in difficult times. And so I want to preach to you this morning about grit. See, Peter's writing to the Jews, and they have scattered about a thousand miles from Rome down into an area there around the Black Sea. And, and he's writing to them saying, look, you've been through some hard times, but you're going to go through tougher times, so toughen up. Buck up. Where's your grit? Where's your resistance? Where's that part of you that says, I'm going to do what's right? Let's read Scripture together, shall we, this morning? We read from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 4. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves. Number one, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his life in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our time, I want you to remember this, but we've spent enough of our time, past lifetime, in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in less lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, those people who do those things, I'm translating, or I'm, I'm uh, explaining, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation or doing the things that you used to do. And therefore they speak evil of you. They will give an account to God who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason the gospel was preached also to those who are dead that they might be judged according to men in the flesh 
but live according to God in the Spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers, and above all things have fervent love. Remember that. Fervent love one for another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, you should speak as though God's listening to you. That's what I mean. Speak as though God's speaking through you. Not nonsense. Not, not, not just frivolous talk that means nothing. But your mouth, your words should be character-driven words as if the Lord himself is listening and as if he is using you as his instrument. If anyone ministers, let it be, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and forever. Amen. So I want to talk to you about grit. I'm going to watch the clock, and I'm going to hurry. I promise to be through by 1 o'clock. Not really. Relax. I'm going to take a moment and tell you part of what drives me. My grandfather, my mother's dad, at about the year of 1900, 1910, as a young man would walk from Ash County, North Carolina with a group of men, the rough roads that existed back then, back through the mountains of western North Carolina and over into West Virginia where the coal mines were. And in those days, because miners made good money, there would be bad women along the way. There'd be thieves. It was dangerous. But they would travel as a group, and my grandfather and a group of men would actually travel to protect each other, and they would stay away from the parties. No drinking, no bad women, and none of the gambling. They stayed away from it, sleeping in the open in protected areas, go to the coal mines, and he would work for months at a time as a mule sir. He was excellent with animals, and he would just work, save his money, walk back to Ash County, Virginia, stay a few weeks, walk back to West Virginia, and then after some time in 1917, he had saved enough money to buy one of the larger farms of Ash County, North Carolina, and became known as one of the more successful farmers on top of the mountain there in Glendale Springs, North Carolina. There are times in my life when I faced challenges, and I refer myself back to Clark Miller and the grit that he had, and I back myself up to the wall, sir, and I say, you are Clark Miller's grandson. Get a grip on it and stand up and walk forward. I vow to you that that has happened many times in my life, and it will happen yet again. Now, Peter is talking to you as the church about grit. He's asking you, when do you buck up your spine and say, here I stand and I will not be moved? And how are you going to do that? Well, he would say, first, you ought to have a fierce loyalty. You've got to have a fierce loyalty. And here's how he says you should do that. You remember I said, now watch this, because he said, let this mind be in you. Arm yourself with the mind of Jesus Christ. Study Jesus Christ and model Jesus Christ until he is your character. And everything about you has a reference point in Jesus Christ. All your motif, all your modus operandi, all of the things that you in life are anchored around and pivot around your knowledge of Jesus Christ. And you say, I have a fierce loyalty to Jesus. I am committed to Jesus Christ. I want to be like him. I had uh, three songs that I had chosen. If you allow me just a moment, I think I can quickly get to them that represent each of these points. And um, the first one would have been this one. To be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, 
That's all I ask, to be like Him. All through life's journey, from earth to glory, that's all I ask, to be like Him. So with a fierce loyalty, you set yourself saying, I want my life to increasingly look like the life of Jesus Christ. And is it mundane? Is it a little trivial for us this morning? If you call yourself a Christian to remember that the word was first used at Antioch, not in a church service, not a, not a bunch of people gathering together, you know, at the feet of Jesus. The first use of the word Christian was out in public because people were acting so much like Jesus that sinners said, they're acting like that Jesus. Wow. So to glibly say I'm a Christian and not look like Jesus is to be out of the character of the first use of the word. Fierce loyalty. Let me speed along. The second one is a forward look. Now, we not have to guess here. Here's what happens. Peter says, now look, I want you to understand. You have already spent too much time over in the sin camp. You already overstayed your stay. You wore out your welcome in the sin camp. You stayed too long. You overstayed your time in the sin camp before you crossed over and said yes to Jesus. He said, now, look, I'm, I need you to understand. Back then, you used to be lewd and full of lust and follow the drunken parties, revelries. I just celebrate life without Jesus and drinking parties. He says that. I didn't say that. I didn't make that up. I didn't go looking for something and, you know, a synonym to compliment my message. The Bible says drinking parties and abominable idolatries. So he says, now look, you've already spent too much time over there. Now get out and stay out. Get out and turn your back to it and walk forward and away. You're in high school, I wouldn't drink. In fact, I looked at a doctor this week and he said, uh, how about alcohol? I said, I don't know what it tastes like. And he said, wow. But in high school, because I wouldn't party with the guys, I was working and sometimes I would hitchhike back and forth to work. I don't recommend that in these days and times. But I worked 12 miles away from high school and I would hitchhike back and forth to work most of the time, each way. And boys picked me up one day and knew who I was. And when they offered me alcohol and I wouldn't take it, they actually poured it on me so my mother would think I'd been part of the party. And still, I said, you know, I'm, you know what, I'm going to give you a clue. Don't you dare ever try and say, well, I'm not going to do something because Pastor Bear said no. The world will never be convinced. Don't you tell them my parents wouldn't approve. They will think you are a wimp first class. Don't you tell them, well, my church doesn't teach that. That won't pass either. I'm serious. The world, they'll make fun of you and they say, well, that, your church is just wacko. But when you look at people and you say, I'm not doing that because of my personal convictions and it's my choice, I'm not doing that, they can't argue with that. So buck up, get some grit and learn to say no. Close the door to the past. Now remember, he said, you've already spent too much time there. You want a song for that? Here's your song for that. Wasted years, wasted years, oh how foolish, as I wandered in darkness and sin. Turn around, Turn around, God is calling, He's calling you from a life of wasted years. So buck up, 
get a forward look, say, I am absolutely determined I'm going to be faithful to God with a fierce loyalty, and I'm going to look forward, not backward. In the interest of getting this sermon rested in your heart, the third point that I would leave with you is you must have a faithful love. A faithful love. Now, I apologize to you, but I didn't do it. Hollywood wrecked the definition of love. Until in our culture, it almost means something physical. Or certainly it means something not godly. It has nothing to do with God, basically, in our culture. But the truth of the matter is, the Greeks had one up on us here while we think we're somebody. The Greeks were smarter than we were in this. They had five different words for love. And so they had the love that's kind of the love of a man-woman. But then there's that other love, and that other love up to five different levels. And that agape love is where God loves you so much that he gave Jesus to die for your sins while you were still dead in trespasses and sins. That agape love is the love of God in which God says he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. It's difficult for me, can I confess, to think that God in heaven loves Kim Jong-un as much as he loves me. I mean, I'm trying to be a good boy. I'm trying to do what's right. I'm trying to go to church and serve God and read the Bible. And I say, God, how much you love Kim Jong-un as much as I love you? He's one of my souls, and I don't want him to perish. Boy, isn't that hard to get a hold of? That's difficult. That God loves people. And that's something we have to settle in our hearts. Now, you're to be commended here at Covenant Church in that you've opened yourself to different cultures. Thank God for that. You've opened up your hearts and you've allowed people to come. And when a black lady from the Ivory Coast gets up and sings, you don't walk out and take a break while she's singing. You don't think about that. You just celebrate the Lord. That's the way, that's good. But I want you to know that it goes beyond that. Notice that what, what Peter's really talking about here, he's talking about a love that, that reaches so profoundly deep that we begin to serve others. We don't just simply say, oh, I love everybody. No, that, that's, that's flippant. That, that's, that's really just reckless talk. It's just saying something to try and impress people. The truth of the matter is that love comes hard. And for those of you who are younger, if I live, you ever ask me to perform a marriage ceremony, and you say, we really want 1 Corinthians 13 in our wedding, this will be my response to you. Please understand, if you want me to read chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians in the wedding ceremony, I will insist that I have time to explain to the congregation that it is one of the toughest chapters in all of the Bible, that it really is about the shed blood of Jesus Christ for his church. It's not a photo op moment in a wedding with crystal goblets and a beautiful bride and a handsome groom. That's not chapter 13. Chapter 13 is a tough chapter in which God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And when we come into the body of Christ, we come in not to be served, but to serve. We come in that we may see others as important as ourselves. God loving them as much as he loves us. So Peter says to them, look, if you want this thing to work now, you gotta get out of your little corner. Some of us didn't grow up in social networks that were very open and very sociable. Some grew up very clannish in their families. Some of us grew up with personalities that are not really social and, and I, I don't like telling you this, but I'm going to tell you. Meeting new people and 
trying to be social at a social gathering is one of the most difficult things of my whole life, even as a pastor. I'm, that's not who I am. My wife says I can ruin any good party with a serious conversation. I mean, everybody can be having a wonderful time at our home, and next thing you know, I'll be talking about philosophy or something, and my wife will look over and roll her eyes and say, he's done it again, he messed up the party. I am not that Mr. Social Gadfly. And that's probably surprising to some of you. You say, but Pastor Barry, I see you. Yes, you know why? Because I read the Scriptures. And because they pushed me out of my comfort zone. On Tuesday, by the grace of God, we will have Jasmine and Corey who will come to Charlottesville for their first time ever. A 14-year-old girl and her 13-year-old brother. And they will be staying with Layla and me in our home. We'll be hosting them for six days. They're from Clinch Valley, Virginia. This past week, they moved into a vacant home. No doors in some of the rooms, floors sinking in areas. I sent a message, said, don't do that. And they said, we have no choice. Eight people in the family. Jasmine is almost a perfect A student. Her brother's a perfect A student in those circumstances. We're going to invite them in. We're going to bring them here. They're going to be in church with you next Sunday. And we're going to say, we love you. And we believe in you. She dreams of being a gynecologist. Amen. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could just put enough wind in their sails to where they would have enough grit that she would not do what most pretty girls like her would do in the community and be pregnant by the time they're 15 or 16? But she would say, no, I'm going to keep my head in my books and I'm going to be one of the few out of this community that goes to college. You see, when the love of God drives you, it's compelling. And you decide you'll make some sacrifices. You decide it's not all about you. You decide that giving away is better than getting. And that the greatest treasures you have are your friends. And the love of God. And therefore Peter says, love. Love unrestrained. Love the body. Love the church. Fall in love with the church. Christ loved the church. That's what the Bible says. Ephesians chapter 5. And he gave his life for the church. May I say to you that theologically that is rendered corporate whole. He would look out at you and say, I love you. But he would also look out and he would call your name individually, Colleen, Moses. He would go right down and he'd call, and I love you. And he would say it looking you straight in the eye. It would be individual and yet corporate. He loves you. And he wants you to love the church. If there's a sickness in the church in America, it's because there are people sitting in church pews who love themselves, but they don't love the church. They don't love the body of Christ. They don't see the prevailing, overarching work of God, the church that Jesus bought with his shed blood. They don't see that he said, I am going to build my church. And they've not bought into it yet. They want the church to serve them. They want the church to meet their needs. But you know what? When you sit in front of a doctor and you tell the doctor, how you are, and the doctor says, you're sick, you need help. But when you tell the doctor, when you say to the doctor, I want you to know I'm at peace within myself, I've been there many times with people, and the people who can sit and look at a doctor and say, doctor, I just want you to know whatever's coming, I'm at peace with God, and I'm at peace with the process. The doctor looks at you and he says, you're my best hope for a good patient. You're the most likely to live. When you can settle the score of your life, do you understand what I'm saying? And when you can say, I belong to Jesus, I have a fierce loyalty to Jesus. And I'm not looking back, and I'm going to give myself away for his church. Then the best of the future is open to you. 
So the third song, if I can pull it up here, that I would share with you here. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with love. I wonder if you'd stand with me this morning. And I wonder how many of you would step out and step toward this altar this morning and say, Pastor Bear, I have a need in my life. This we never do. We will never invade your privacy. If you care to share, you're welcome to share and you're welcome to come down from above and come to the altar and stand here. We'll have prayer with you. You have, a, you have something pressing your heart. You know what? I'm going to be candid with you as a pastor this morning. I'm standing before you brokenhearted this morning because a young man that I've been trying to draw to the Lord, he's not hungry. I'm going to tell you out loud. He's not hungry. He's got fancy equipment. He's got money in the bank, but he chose to go work a job this morning just to make money instead of be in church. Now, in my heart, as a pastor, I want to say, God, take away from him stuff until you humble him. But I'm not sure that's a sanctified prayer. You understand that? But it's how I feel. Because inside, I'm angry. I've, I've paid dues on his account. I've tried so hard, and I was so offended when he sent me a picture and thought I'd be impressed that he was working on a job this morning just to make money. You see, because that doesn't speak to what I'm preaching about. It doesn't speak to the grit that you say, no, I'm going to church. I got up at five o'clock this morning before the clock went off. I want to go to church. I want to go to church. I want to be part of the church. When our son, for those of you who are new, when our son laid in the funeral home, I got up on a Sunday morning and I said, I want to go to church. I need to be in church. And I remember where I sat. Be back to the right from pulpit in this area, second or third pew. And I will tell you, I didn't want to stand up. I didn't want to kneel down. I didn't want people talking to me. I just want people to leave me alone. But I was in church and I was saying, God, I'm going to stick it out. Layla and I are going to serve you. We'll take our son down to the cemetery, but we're going to serve you. Am I talking to you this morning? I want you to hear me this morning. Where's the grit? The grit to say no to sin and to stand up and to square our shoulders and to say we are marching forward for Jesus Christ and we love the church. Father, I'm believing you that you're going to take the words of this preacher this morning and the words of scripture that I've shared, the words of Simon Peter, who is now in your presence, who was crucified upside down. According to history, I have preached my heart out to this people that they would take a look at their life and ask themselves if they have the grit to pass the test, to be called a Christian and to live the life that is a life in Jesus Christ, not looking back, loving the body. May you do your heart in our hearts. May you give to us by your spirit resolve and determination that the Holy Spirit would cause us to put one foot in front of the other until we have finished well, until others would see us as being champions in difficult times. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and the people said, Amen and Amen and Amen to the families who are visiting today. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here for the dedication of children and to all of you who are here in worship. God bless you and to those who are traveling, we pray their safe return. God bless you. Go in peace. Go with God.